Uh, good morning, everybody. Morning. Good, morning. Good, morning. good morning. Hello, everybody. Good morning, Hi. all. Morning, Mike. Uh, morning. A very warm welcome to you all to today's virtual networking event to discuss the future of air travel in the post-COVID world. So my name is Carl Friedman. I think I know a lot of you, if not most of you. Um, I'm Vice President, Business Development and Operations with Bamza and Batra in India, uh, currently based in Mumbai. Uh, we're very pleased to have with us today three subject matter experts on the panel who have very kindly agreed to join us in today's event and share their views with us from the different perspectives of the, the passenger's perspective, the travel industry, and also from the airline's perspective. So if you could please join me in welcoming uh, Mr. Praveen Gandhi. He's the ex-CEO of Carlson Wagon Lee Travel in India. Uh, Mr. Vimal Rai, he's the founder and MD of Trace Consulting, joining us today from Hong Kong. And Mr. Werner Hazen, who's a senior expert with Vams and Batra in Germany and the ex-director for South Asia Lufthansa, joining us bright and early today. I think it's very early still in Germany, Werner, uh, yes, from Germany. <laughs> The gentlemen have prepared short videos to introduce themselves, which I shall be playing shortly. And then after their discussion, the panel discussion, we shall be opening the floor for an open free flowing discussion um, where all participants can ask questions and express their various points of view. So without further ado, I will just play the introduction video so you'll get an idea of uh, who we've got on the panel today. Just bear with me a second, I have to Share my screen. Well, there is no voice. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm sorry, did you say the sound wasn't coming through? Yeah, that's, that's right. right. Okay, apologies for that. Let me try again. Please give me a second. Okay. I'll also suggest you mute everyone, please. Yeah. Hi, I'm Praveen Gandhi, finance and travel professional, chartered accountant by qualification. And I've spent most of my career in managing finance and the travel business in various uh, large and multinational companies. I was the CFO of CWT in India until 2003. And that was the time they decided to elevate me to the position of the CEO as well as the board member of the company. I was managing CWT in India until 2012. And then I decided to move on to Middle East to join Kanu Travel. Kanu Travel is a company which is owned by a Kanu group and have their travel interests in eight countries in Middle East as well as in UK. I was managing the entire piece. Uh, I retired from Kanu in 2018 and came back to India to lead a retired life. However, I was approached by many companies in India and overseas to support or help them in their change management programs. Uh, I've been very passionate about taking the businesses to the next level in terms of EBITDA growth by means of restructuring, re-engineering, driving efficiencies and the productivity as well as the supplier management programs. I have extensive experience in pre, post and on the m and transactions. I am quite excited and looking forward to have the engaging and interactive session with all of you. Thank you. Hello everybody. My name is Vimal Rai. Um, I'd love to tell you a little bit about myself before the webinar begins. I have been in travel and aviation for about 22 years now. I started out my career with Singapore Airlines. I moved on to Jet Airways in Mumbai. And along the way, I lived in about seven, maybe eight different cities in Europe and in Asia Pacific. Uh, these days, I live in wonderful Hong Kong. 
Um, I've been here for about nine years and I run my company that's called Trace Consulting. Trace stands for Travel Retail Aviation Customer Excellence. It's a management consultancy that focuses on three things, strategy, operations, and marketing. I've helped a number of businesses within the travel domain um, grow and scale their operations through various means. Uh, for example, improving go-to-market strategies, fundraising strategy, partnerships, um, and, and so on and so forth. These days, I like to spend my time um, quite a bit on LinkedIn, where I am also in the business of teaching individuals and companies in the travel domain how to market themselves more effectively using social media. So I'm really, really happy to be here. I really, really miss flying, as you can see. And uh, I'm grateful to be on this webinar. Thank you so much to Vamza Batra, and I'm really looking forward to this. My name is Werner Hazen. I would like to introduce myself prior to joining the round today. Before I joined Dr. Vamza and Batra, I was working for Lufthansa for more than 40 years in various managerial positions, uh, of, out of which I spent more than 23 years abroad. However, my most exciting years were the three tenures in India, which accumulated to 13 years altogether. My duties included the exciting job with then Modi Luft, a domestic carrier which was set up by Lufthansa. I was one of the manager and directors. And my last designation was Director South Asia for Lufthansa, German Airlines again based in Delhi. My responsibilities included the driving, uh, driving the expansion of Lufthansa uh, in India and to make sure that the needs of Indian air travelers were properly included in the uh, services of the airline. I was also the, a member of the board of the Indo-German Chamber of Commerce and their president in the year 2006-2007. I'm also uh, holding um, a lectureship at a German university dealing with international uh, management and aviation. And I'm looking forward now to the round which is soon to come. Thank you. So, um, can you all hear me okay? If you just put your hands up if you can hear me. Okay, fantastic, brilliant. Well, thank you very much for preparing those introductory videos. Um, so I think uh, we can all agree it's going to be an extremely interesting session today with uh, three experts representing different aspects. We've got Vimal, who's representing the perspective of, uh, of passengers, Verna um, representing airlines, and Praveen representing the travel industry in general. So um, I think there's going to be hopefully some conflicting perspectives as well to make this more interesting, if we're lucky. Um, so maybe, gentlemen, if you could just get the ball rolling with a quick general overview of your thoughts. And uh, I think we'll do this in alphabetical order. So Praveen, if we could start with you, please. Yeah, so good morning to all of you. And uh, my thanks, Carl, to you for having invited me over to join this group. Uh, talking in general, as you know, uh, the topic which has been given to me is more on the economics. What is going to happen is the new normal, which is going to really come in the post-COVID era, is going to be a little different from pre-COVID era. era. Uh, breakdown of COVID has led to the breakdown of economies all over the world. And the breakdown of economies has led to breakdown of the economy in the countries, as well as in the states, as well as in the companies as well. Different experts, are really talking about the contraction of the economy starting from 5% to 15%. Impact is going to be different and it would vary from company to company, from country to country, from state to state. We are focusing here how it is going to really affect the economy of the companies, those who are buying, procuring the travel, you know, and how it is going to really impact the economy of the travel as such. Uh, so when we really go down into the deeper into the discussions, possibly we'll see the deeper impact and we'll try to understand what could be the impact on the various companies because the 
now the economies are going to move into recession recession possibly is going to move into depression in some of the countries some of the companies are going to change their budgets drastically some are not going to do that uh, we will really get into the details of that as we move forward however one thing is for sure with the with the socio economic changes which are going to come up in the post covid era it is going to have a significant economic impact on the travel budgets of the airlines of the companies and in general related to aviation so i i leave it here and so that we can go deeper into the discussion as we move forward okay thank you very much praveen and uh vimal yes thanks carl hi everyone um thank you to vamza batra again for having me as a panelist um i i love flying as you can see in my background um you know i i think before we look at the future of air travel we need to understand where we have come from pre covid um and you know what aviation as a as a whole represents to all of us traditionally um and of the three of us who are the panelists today i i really do want to bring in a strong customer perspective you know we are all looking at the same sets of data the same statistics the same government actions or inactions are affecting all of us but very few of us are able to integrate what you know all of these things mean in terms of consumer psychology and and expectation um in the future when things need to be recalibrated as as far as airlines and aviation is concerned so i think the first the first big thing that i want to talk about is how aviation is uh, an enabler right um you know world tourism council uh, or organization says that a total of 330 million jobs are supported by the aviation industry worldwide it contributes to about 10% or almost 9 trillion us dollars of global gdp annually um but we also see that the pace of recovery and change uh, or the pace of reopening is different across different countries and sometimes even within the same country we look at india right i mean there's different zones and all of that so the net result is tremendous uncertainty and confusion about what can and can't be undertaken entire business models have been disrupted financial constraints have actually caused cash flows for many companies to be obliterated border closures regulations and even things like racism have caused entire supply chains to be redefined completely so what impact will all of this have on people finances disposable income trade tourism and then most importantly on psychological health uh, or psychological welfare of travelers the second thing i want to talk about is you know aviation is actually zero or nothing without travelers i know it sounds self evident but th you know think about it in 2019 we had 1.4 billion travelers around the world when that comes down to a trickle like it is now there is no need for aircrafts even airports will become redundant we've seen how airlines have now decided to uh, shelf a380s and return them or sell them off right so the flow of labor business supply chain everything gets changed in a time like this understanding traveler psychology becomes paramount when aviation first started in the early decades of the 20th century we recognized that safety was an absolute necessity over time especially after 911 we also started talking about security now with covid-19 i think we have to add one more s sanitization so what will consumers expect in terms of sanitization so the the key question in my mind is really what is the new purpose of airlines going to be is it simply to carry people from a to b and what if a to b is actually really close together right which is what all the research is showing that all of us want to do we don't want to travel long haul for the for the immediate future so what if they're so close together and if your your whole uh, raison d'etre as an airline is to carry people from a to b your your purpose is nullified right so clearly airline sense of purpose needs to be a lot wider and a lot bigger and lastly i'm sorry i know i'm going on for a bit but lastly i i think we need to understand that aviation has traditionally been a very high touch business right for decades now thanks to great marketing and advertising and particularly with low cost airlines coming to the fore in the last 20 years flying has become a real experience for everybody we can argue whether that experience was good or bad but for sure it was a very emotional experience for many many people covid-19 has changed everything with, ex with with respect to how we as consumers are now consuming and experiencing life i mean fundamentally we've been experiencing life for the last 3 months through a screen 
like this. So, you know, we, 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 we can do things like listen to uh, Andrea Bocelli sing in front of the Milan Cathedral. We can do virtual uh, safaris in Kenya. We, we can have magic, throw, uh, magic shows through Airbnb. But, you know, the, the, the list is endless. But what does this mean in a post-COVID situation when things open up again? Is our behavior going to just spring back to the way things were? Or are we going to be somewhat changed in our choices and our expectations? Um, and, you know, even when people travel, what are the expectations going to be around social distancing, uh, around the middle seat, which in my opinion is a very stupid debate today in the aviation industry. I, I don't think middle seats are going to happen at all. I, I, sorry, I don't think middle seats are going to be blocked off, right? So it's really difficult to project. And these are the three points that I wanted to leave, leave sort of uh, introduce this, this whole discussion with. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, Werner, would you like to add any of your thoughts on this? Yeah, good morning to you all. And, uh, I'm very happy to be able to join this interesting round. Um, the subject has been covered. Um, I'm representing the general airline point of view. Um, Vimal has covered quite a range of points, which we will further elaborate in the few, a few more minutes. I just wanted to highlight a few points which um, I would like to um, explain and to for which I would like to share my opinion. One area is health and special care. COVID-19 will definitely have an impact on air travel. This is my firm opinion and it will uh, appear in two dimensions. One is short term and one is long term. You, you can already see that immediate measures uh, have been taken already. They are impacting, uh, you know, the comfort of travel to a very large extent. And the, the question uh, has already come up, would this be a sustainable kind of change or uh, will, be, uh, will, be, be, um, will the airline business uh, come, be able to gradually come uh, to a normal situation as we had before? The second area which I would like to cover are ecological developments. Um, the governments uh, all over the world, including India, but also Europe, they have already applied certain pressures on airlines to improve their ecological performance. It has been already a subject and an issue in the past, but this situation will further have an impact on the developments, on the decision-making process and have certain changes. So we have to see what it means from, for airlines, you know, well, how they will respond to it, um, you know, voluntary or being forced to new government regulations or even through a worldwide change of approaches. And last but not least, I mean, Vimal uh, has already covered it briefly, it is the economic outlook. Uh, if there is no air movement, there is, there is zero, there's zero traffic. I mean, there is no income, there is no revenue. I mean, this is a situation unheard of in the industry. Even September 11, where we as airliner thought that was the worst uh, ever experienced case in the, in the recent history, is nothing against what we are um, you know, experiencing today. So the demand and supply situation has already changed and will drastically change in the near future. Um, there will be certainly, at least for a period of time, limited or not, uh, less demand. There will be overcapacity and uh, some airlines will desperately trying to generate cash for, to survive. So um, the question is, will that be a short-term development? Will some airlines emerge stronger than ever before? Will airlines disappear? Um, what kind of short-term or long-term scenario are we going to face? Not only from the airline point of view, but finally also, it will definitely affect the passengers, the consumers. And that is something which I would like to share in detail with you in a few minutes as well. I'm looking forward to a very interactive round with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Werner. Thanks very much. And I think um, if I may, I'll, I'll get the the process is going with a, a question to you, Vimal, and it's actually something that's really very much on my mind, and that is how, how you think the customer experience will change due to the, health, the new health implications. Now, I've got these horror images of myself wearing a mask for eight hours to go to, uh, it's just, the, the, the thought makes me shudder, the thought alone. What are your views on that? Yeah, you know, I, I live in a country called Hong Kong, and I don't know if anybody on the, uh, on the call today has been here before, but even eight, 10 years ago, right? Primarily because of SARS back in 2003, 
anytime anybody had a cough or a cold, they would wear a mask automatically. And I would be one of those people who would laugh, like, like you, I, I, you know, cough and cold is nothing, right? I mean, you know, it's no big deal. But over here, people take it really, really seriously. And the idea is that I protect you from my cough. That's the impression, right? So I think, long story short, I think wearing a mask is going to be there for air travel for some time to come. I think you can't run away from that. I'm not sure you're going to have to keep it on in flight, but I'm sure mask technology, if there is such a thing, is going to improve, right? We are already seeing uh, lots of brands coming out with different types of masks that are more breathable and so on and so forth. But in a larger scale, Carl, I think right now there is a lot of confusion. So if you, if you talk about consumer perspectives or traveler perspectives right now, there's, there's a lot of confusion. You know why? Because there is no global authority that is able to say, these are the 20 things you need to do if you want to fly. Every government, every civil aviation authority is imposing their own set of rules and regulations around what can happen. So some countries are saying, oh, all inbound has to be quarantined 14 days. What's the point of that? There is no travel. You, you can't travel. If, if Austria is saying this, I'm never going to go to Austria, right? I'm never going to travel to Austria if I'm going to be quarantined for 14 days, right? Um, some countries are saying, okay, we will allow transit. Like Dubai has just said they're going to allow transit flights. Hong Kong has also announced they're going to allow transit flights. But what's the point of transit if you, if you as a customer don't know whether you can travel out and where can I go to? And why would I transit via Dubai, right? So, you know, there, there's, a, there's a lot of uncertainty in general around um, what can be done, what is actually the meaning of clean, who defines sanitization. Um, if I don't see somebody cleaning, cleaning, should I assume that something is clean, not clean? You know, so I, I think from a, from a health and sanitization perspective, these are the foremost concerns in yeah. um, the minds of travelers. Yeah, well, the, what really struck me in what you said just now is this quarantine business. And I, I think, um, I mean, how, how is that going to affect corporate travel, uh, Praveen? I mean, yeah, so uh, listening to Vimar and to Werner, you know, I mean, it's a very, very interesting and a very pertinent point. Uh, what is more important today? Is it the health? Is it the general environment? Is it the economy? And, and when I really hear the different gentlemen and the different perspectives coming over, I do find so there is a conflict between the economy and the uh, other other uh, health parameters and the environment parameters that we are talking about. You know, health parameter says that we should keep the middle seat blocked. Economy says no. Health pyramid parameter says that we should have a quarantine for seven days to fourteen days. Economy says no. So I I, I really do not know uh, what what would be the right way to really take it forward. What would be the different decisions taken by the different countries? Uh, what would be the policies which will be framed. Uh, but yes, there is an inherent conflict between these two particular points. You know, that is what I can, I can see glaringly. Now, coming on, to the, uh, coming on to the point, which a very pertinent point, which Vimal has raised that uh, who is going to define what should be the protocol? You know? Who is going to define what is touchless processes and what is going to be the uh, processes with the personalized experiences, you know? So bigger questions that really come to my mind is uh, what is the role of the ITA in that? You know, it is the, it is the highest global uh, authority in terms of aviation. Now, each company, local or global or, or, a, or a multinational company has something called business contingency plan, disaster management programs. You know. Now, if you really look at the COVID, it gives me a feeling that all the BCPs and all the disaster management plans possibly have failed here. I don't think any of the BCPs or any of the disaster management programs within the companies or at the global or the international level possible, possibly would have catered to a situation whereby the entire world comes to a lockdown. And that is what has happened. So bigger questions to really look at if, if somebody could have anticipated these particular situations, we should have had the protocols, we should have had the BCPs, we should have had the different ways of looking to the things so that a situation like this does not come up whereby the entire world has to go into the lockdown. Entire aviation has to go into the complete breakdown. 
Now, will it really impact the companies? Will it really impact the business travel? Will it really impact the travel budgets? Yes, it will. I think it is going to change the way the companies are going to look at their travel spend. Here. It is going to change the way the companies are going to draft or outline their travel objectives and the travel policies and the procedures and the procurement policies. Now, it would depend what would be the new norms, what would be the new reset, how the world would be reset, what would be the new order in the, in, in the, in the world. Uh, fares will go up. Yes, certainly fares will go up. How much will they go up? We really do not know as of now. I'll, I'll come on to the later about the government regulations which have come up. Uh, social distancing norms. Will it work at the airport? Yes, it will. Will it work within the aircraft? We are not going to leave the middle seats locked. Will it work? I don't know. Yes, it is very, very difficult to sit with the shield and a visor on your face for 8 hours or 10 hours or 15 hours. So will we really go back to the sh short haul flights instead of long haul flights? I don't know. It is yet to really come up. What are in the last two months, if you really see the biggest change that has come up in the corporate world is the e-meetings. You know, everybody has been doing the business on the e-meetings. And if, if we are able to conclude and if we are able to strike some big deals in terms of e-meetings, then why do we need to travel? It's a very, very big question mark. You know, do we really need to travel? If yes, how much can we really avoid? In travel business, if you really look at it, it has always been considered to be a discretionary travels, discretionary spend within the company. You know. Though it is the fourth line in terms of P&L, if you really see from the top, uh, it is the fourth largest spend, particularly in the service industry, if not into the manufacturing industry, because there are the cost, raw of the cost material cost is really, really different. You know. uh, and it's a very, very large spend. Now, in a situation like this, in the post-COVID era, each and every company is going to preserve and accumulate as much liquidity as possible. So they would avoid the travel as much as, much as possible. It will get muted for some time, short to near term. In the long term, it might pick up again and it would pick up again. Will the critical business people will travel for the business critical? Yes, they would. You know. But possibly the frequency of the travel will come down. It will not be as much as it used to be in short to long term, short to mid term. You know. In the long term, it might pick up again. Uh, how are the objectives are going to change? Travel policies are going to change. They are going to be much more dependent upon the safety, security, hygiene levels, cleanliness of the properties where you are going to stay. It is expectations from the travel agencies are going to change. Who is going to really give the BCPs which are aligned to the uh, objectives of the corporates, it is going to change depending upon the touchless services which the corporates are going to, travel businesses are going to give it to the corporates. You know. So I think there would be change in the deliverables, there would be change in the expectations of the companies, there would be change in the economy, and there would be change the way we select our travel service providers. Uh, this is how I really look at it in, ter in terms of uh, how the economics of the travel will change in the, in the corporates. Coming on to the fares for a, for a, for a short while, uh, at least in India, I, mean, I can see a lot of people are from India. I can possibly, most of you know that India the regulatory bodies, at least for the three months, they have made the entire routes into the seven zones and they have defined the lower caps as well as the upper caps of the fares. You know. Nobody can charge, no airline, not even a private airline can charge a higher fare than what has been defined by this regulatory body. And they've also specified that at least 40% of the tickets which are issued by the airlines have to be on a less than the middle point of these fares which have been lower and the upper caps which have been defined by the uh, regulatory bodies. Is it good? I really don't know. Yeah. Uh, certainly airlines are not going to like it. Uh, certainly airlines possibly would fight it in the days to come, but maybe after, after some time. I really do not know what is the situation in different countries. You know, uh, I, I would request Werner to let us know how the fares are really panning out in, in Germany. But for sure, such a situation cannot really exist in the international fares. This is only and only for the domestic fares in India. So, Werner, may I request you to please share with us uh, how the fares are really uh, looking like in Germany or in Europe? Sure. 
Um, I could make out there are a couple of uh, big issues and highlights um, and before coming to the fairs, uh, which have an impact on, on fair structures and, and future developments as well. There's a big amount of uncertainty. I mean, we were coming from a situation where we could plan one year, two year, three years in advance. This is no longer valid at the moment. We had standards in the past. We had, you mentioned this, uh, Prabin, a, a very high degree of standardization. I think the airline industry was, uh, because of its complexity and its, its global activities, was highly standardized. I mean, the, the regulations uh, of, um, you know, how airlines would work together, how, uh, you know, procedures uh, harmonize for the benefit of the passenger. This is also all not possible at the moment. Um, you know, when we are talking about health regulations, um, we are experiencing that even in Europe, each country, uh, even in Germany, each state has some, uh, some individual regulations. How can a passenger understand what is going on? And uh, these have regulations, uh, different uh, travel regulations, whether one can enter a country or not, are not really clear. So we don't even know, you know, uh, when travel would be allowed between India and Germany or uh, Europe and India or India and, uh, and, and, and other countries. So this is, a, this is a very open point and procedures, we don't even know what kind of procedures will apply. We definitely know that traveling, let's say from Delhi to Los Angeles, wearing a mask for 12 or 13 hours, where you can hardly breathe, uh, don't uh, enjoy your passenger comfort as you have done in the past. This is not possible. So what are the solutions? So I will also uh, cover the subject in a few minutes, but I do not want to evade the question which uh, Praveen has uh, stated. We are at a standstill. There's no business or hardly no business. So there will be two developments which are prevailing um, at least already in Europe, that, um, but also in Asia, that airlines are desperately trying to generate cash. They have overcapacity, they wanted to lower fares, um, no matter whether this approach would be economic or not, just to express to, to, to generate cash, to pay for their, for, their, for their daily operations. They are all in a desperate situation. So we will find a situation where this could happen, it will happen, but it is certainly not a situation which will last very long. The, 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 the loss of revenues over a long time will definitely lead to a collapse of airlines. You will not uh, experience the same scenario of airlines in India as well as in Europe as we have, see today. Some airlines will disappear forever. It has already started. Some airlines can only survive by uh, getting subsidies uh, by their respective governments. Some Airlines feel that they're strong enough to, um, to uh, survive on their own, which has yet to be seen, because somehow um, the economic issue, the economic question will remain valid for all. So um, coming back to the first developments, I do see, and this is a general view, you know, as an airliner, that there will be a tendency of higher airfares in future. In Europe, we are discussing uh, amongst analysts that it could be anything between 30 and 40 percent in the extremist cases, but there will be a tendency of, of uh, higher airfares because as long as we don't know whether the full capacity of an aircraft can be sold, are we being forced to, as airlines, to leave the middle seat vacant or uh, are we uh, forced to operate with limited capacity only in terms of overall seat capacity? Um, will will uh, other costs go up? Um, will the demand be lesser? So that means um, fewer people are traveling. We're expecting this, that we're expecting that uh, the, the business Sorry, will Vimal, go up. Vimal, were you putting your hand up? Sorry to interrupt, Werner. Sorry, I, I, I didn't want to interrupt Werner, but whenever he's done, I just want to say something. Okay, sorry, sorry. So, so there will be a development uh, towards fare increases, most probably. There will be a different development concerning leisure travel and corporate travel. Praveen has mentioned this already. Um, in Europe, um, there is a tendency um, already uh, coming to the conclusion that business travel will not uh, increase but decrease in the next, in the near future, in the foreseeable future. Uh, but uh, we are expecting the recovery mainly in leisure travel, and this could be 
evening happening on, on midterm, uh, in, in midterms. We see this already uh, happening in, in Germany, but in other countries as well. So concerning fares, um, I expect um, as an airliner that uh, the fares will, the, this tendency of having low, low fares will not sustain. There will be a strong impact by the government also based on uh, environmental uh, considerations, saying that um, a fare, a, 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 a trip of one hour or two hours costing only 10 euros does not make sense anymore. We should think of other options. This is not a, a scenario uh, which uh, we could uh, further afford. So we need to think of um, sharing business by different carriers, be it, air, be it airlines, be it uh, railways, and so on. So this is already there. This is not new. But the situation, as we are experiencing right now, will accelerate these developments uh, very soon. Okay. So I leave it at this, uh, because I have some other points which I would like to mention. But uh, in order to keep the discussions and the dialogue running, I take a break now. So, Vimal, you want you want to ask something? Yeah, no, I I, I didn't want to ask anything. I mean, you know, it's clearly a very emotional issue, as we can see. You know, Verna and Praveen have have got very uh, 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 strong views about things. I I just want to come back to the customer side of things again. You know, fares are obviously a big consideration. BCG just did a survey. McKinsey has done surveys. Uh, Focus right, uh, Skift, all these guys have done surveys, and everybody says two things, right? So, sixty percent of people say that even with low fares, they're not going to fly because they're scared about their health, right? Uh, sorry, not 60%, 40 to 60% of people say they will not fly, depending on which country you look at across Europe, uh, and then if you look at the US, and then if you look at APAC, right? So between 40 to 60%, the, the range is about there, right? But you know what that means? That also means that 40 to 60% of people will fly if they are low fares. So I think, number one, I, I agree that, you know, fares will go up in general. And do you know why they will go up? Let me explain why they will go up. Fares will go up because all the sanitization procedures, all the new materials that aircrafts are going to be made of, you know, um, aircraft manufacturers are talking about using composites that are uh, antibacterial, antimicrobial, and so on, right? Um, all these things are going to cost money. And guess who's going to pay for it, right? Governments are not subsidizing it. We are going to have to pay for it as consumers, right? That's what health is going to cost. But once airfares go up, don't forget, you have the big boys, the big low-cost boys like Ryanair, EasyJet, AirAsia, all these other guys who are definitely going to come in with low, low, low fares. They are going to try and stimulate the market because they know that there's at least 50% of the market that will travel if assuming borders are open, there's the ability to travel, and with low fares, people will take that chance. I've got a question um, to what you just said when you started off, Emma. Why are people scared of flying? Where do they see the link between flying and in this case, COVID? Because I, for example, don't see it. I mean, I understand the surfaces need to be cleaned differently and so on and so forth, yeah, but the sure. air on the plane is actually quite fresh, right? Yeah, so this is completely irrational. And, and exactly. I, I don't want to. I, I I don't want to speak bad of anybody, but you know, fear by its very definition is irrational. If fear was rational, then it wouldn't be fear, right? So fear of catching a virus in an enclosed environment like an airplane is yeah. a real fear. I mean, a lot of research has gone into this, which shows that again, about forty to fifty percent of people are, are just scared of traveling because it means going to a crowded place like an airport. Yeah in an enclosed environment like an airline. So they don't seem to understand that a lot of newer aircraft have got these HEPA filters, high efficiency particle uh, accelerator uh, filters that separate and, and the air in the aircraft actually moves at a pretty fast speed. It's recirculated every three minutes and, and so yeah. on. Right? But um, the fear is there. I would like I to... I, 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 sorry. Sorry, sorry um, Carl. I would like to add something concerning the developments of airfares with low with low carrier with low cost carriers. Uh, there are two dimensions uh, to it. One is, of course, airfares will some some segments uh, of the market or some carriers will further um, offer be offering low low fares. But the question is, is that enough trigger to have a passenger traveling? Uh, I doubt it because, I mean, if you look at the past history of, of uh, Ryanair or EasyJet in, in, in Europe, for instance, 
they, 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 they got people to travel which have never thought of traveling because uh, the airfare was extremely low and they could afford it. But what will not lower necessarily are the costs for local transportation, for hotels and other costs in respective cities. They said we will never travel to Rome. Uh, we would have never thought of traveling to Rome because it's now too, uh, too uh, has become so inexpensive because the airfare is too low. Uh, but the other costs remain. So there will be a segment of travel which has been triggered and supported by low-cost travelers in the past, will, which, which will no longer uh, being afford, uh, will no longer afford uh, traveling because of the economical situation. I mean, uh, in, in Germany, for instance, uh, about, uh, if I'm not mistaken, one third um, or even more of the population is, 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 is working on conditions where working hours are being cut short, the, air, the, the income is, is cut by 20 or 30 percent. So this additional travel, which has been triggered to this kind of, uh, you know, efforts, um, is no, it's at least midterm or short term is no longer there. So yes, there will be there will be low cost travel. The question is, will that be the same dimension, or will it have be less? In my personal opinion, and I can only express my personal opinion in the absence of any figures, that will be less. This segment will shrink. And on top of that, Werner, there's also the additional pressure, which um, was building very, very strongly before COVID, with this whole um, Greta thing of catching boats to North America and trains within Europe and so on and so forth. And uh, I think they called it flight shaming. So there was that whole flight shaming movement just before COVID. Do you, do you, think, do you think COVID will be seen as an opportunity to maybe make flying more environmentally friendly faster? You have a very valid point. Uh, my answer is, I mean, my personal answer, I have to say, is definitely yes, because you could see it, for instance, the French government has made it the conditions to give subsidies to Air France because they, for, they, are, they are going to force Air France to, uh, to reduce the number of domestic flights. This, these discussions are going on, at least politically, in Germany. Do we need uh, uh, domestic flights at all or um, shall the German railways uh, take over the position uh, for domestic uh, traffic? So there is a clear development, as you were rightly assuming, that since, you know, this uh, uh, greater development or this being ashamed of flying development has already a certain impact to, on public perception, but also the policies, uh, international policies are taking up, etc. Yes, I do definitely expect a change, a mind change and a policy change. And I'm sure that many governments will take this opportunity to change, to become more restrictive when it comes to short-term travel. And maybe there will be also some minimum pricing or some new conditions, which we have never experienced before, um, leading to a situation where this free market of extremely low fares cannot be continued as it used to be in the past. But, um, no, a follow-on question to Vimal, who's, who's very bravely representing passengers today. Do, do you think passengers really care? I mean, were they really being shamed? Or I mean, I saw lots of press about flight shaming and so on and so forth. But to be honest, I, there was not one, I, I'm, I'm putting this out there, there's not one flight less that I took because of that. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I, think, I, I think the problem we have today with flight shaming is that it's a, it's a nice buzzword that's come into the lexicon of all of our languages, right? <laughs> um, if you notice the ones who are the most vocal about it, it's the Swedish. Right, because that's where she's from. Um, there's anecdotal evidence that you know Swedes have traveled eight percent less or eight percent fewer Swedes, or they've taken eight percent fewer flights. I don't even know what the what the data is meant to represent. Um, but you know what we should look at is we should look at two things, right? So we should look at let's let's ask the Germans, right? Let's let's see because the Germans are the most intrepid travelers in all of Europe. So let's see whether flight shaming has actually impacted. You know whether that's actually a reason why people will not travel. And it's going to be very difficult to, to, to do this. I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, you know, when you ask people questions in an interview, they like to sound great. So, you know, in two months' time, when you ask somebody, why have you stopped traveling? Or have you stopped traveling? Yes, I've traveled about 50% less. Why have you stopped traveling? They'll probably tell you, oh, you know, I've cut down on my travel because it's ecologically friendly and yada, yada. But you actually don't know if the guy's doing it because he's scared of COVID because his personal disposable income, as Werner talked about, has come down. Whether his business has suffered and so he doesn't need to travel. 
whether he feels there is no investment needed in business travel because there is no revenue to be made, right? So 20 other reasons that you don't ask could be the actual reason. But the second group of people we need to ask, you know, uh, other than the Germans, for example, is maybe we should ask the Chinese and the Indians. Why am I picking on Chinese and Indians? Because these are still developing economies. And in developing economies, the one big thing that drives everybody, right, is upward mobility, upward economic mobility. As you move into the middle class, you aspire to fly. And that's the big reason why low-cost carriers like Air Deccan in the past, Sahara, Air Asia have all started, they all started doing so well in the last 10 years, right? Because they had super low fares that inspired everybody to fly, in, including in China. So I think we need to see the behavior of these segments of the population and, and to ask if actually flight shaming is going to become a real movement. It might be. I'm not saying it's not. We might have a valid point there because there were some uh, earlier this year in, in I'm relating it to Germany, but it's valid for China and India as well. There were some surveys on, 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 on the reasons for travel or the impact on environmental issues on travel. And that was exactly your point. People were saying on one hand, yes, I'm taking environmental uh, you know, problems very seriously. We need to do something. And the second question was, are you restricting your travel? Are you not traveling by air anymore? Are you, do you have firm plans not to fly? And nine, I'm, not forget, I'm not forgetting the figure, 98% said, no, I will continue flying. There you go. So, uh, so the, 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 it's wishful thinking uh, on one hand, but on the other hand, um, there's yet a driver which has an impact on, on, on the travel decisions. This is what I mentioned before. These are the economics. There are more people now not being a, they will be, who will not be able to have the same travel budgets as they had before. They want yep. to travel, but they can't afford it, can't afford it. And this is something which is going to happen already this year in, in, uh, in Europe. As yeah, I think, I think you're going to have one more factor which neither of us have talked about, which is supply, right? We're all talking about demand. Right. And supply yes. is also going to be constrained because, you know, tomorrow, next month or next week or next, next two months or whatever, you know, it's not a simple case of pulling off all the tarp of the aircraft and restarting the engines and start flying. Cool. You know, 70% uh, of aircrafts around the world have been parked in 200 locations around the world, right? getting them back into your hub or your stations, getting them ready to restart operations is one part of the problem. Getting all your crew, getting all the slots, getting all the, the engineers, I mean, it's another part of the problem. Making sure you have demand is the third part of the problem. So yeah. all of these things as well, right? Just because you want to fly, I mean, I, I would love to go to Seychelles. I don't know how I would ever go to you know, Seychelles in the next six months. Yeah. Well, on top of all that, Vimal, there's a, a fourth issue, and that's the timetables we had before COVID will probably be impossible after COVID. Um, I, I think planes used to be sanitized once a week or something. I, I'm not sure those some number like that, but def, it has definitely have to be much more often now, and therefore there'll be fewer planes available at any given time to fly. So that's going to change things as well. But, but I think I, I think this would be a good time to. Um, open the floor to questions from the participants because we've only got a few minutes left actually 10 15 minutes maximum so i, I don't know if um anybody have any has any questions please feel free to unmute yourselves and ask uh, hi carl can i yeah hi ketan how are you very good very good i'm sorry i'm not putting on the video oh, that's okay no <laughs> problem desirable for this <laughs> for them okay. no, no worries. Um, my, my question, my point, uh, a little longish, uh, but it's an extension of what Vimal said, especially in the context of India. Uh, in India, flying is still a very aspirational uh, um, phenomenon. Having said that, um, uh, the backdrop of, uh, for a decade, a little, little more than a decade now, private, uh, uh, private companies in the airline industry and um, mostly government uh, offerings have all been breeding. And time and again, government has come out to their rescue, given them packages, uh, and uh, investors of the country, the market uh, in general, hasn't taken very nicely to that package. I mean, there's a sentiment in the market that says, um, you know, why, uh, why keep pushing, why keep putting extra money 
into a non performing asset for a company uh, and uh, so on that backdrop i think because the current government in india uh, was the opposition back then and were the biggest vocalists of this thing uh, of the opposition and now they are in the government so probably they will have a tough time bailing out with a huge lucrative package to this industry so the industry is not getting a boost uh, travel regulations are going down we've all spoken a lot about how demand will definitely see a cut supply is going to be uh, cut and then plus government has come out with a uh, with a with a constriction on the pricing there is an upper uh, tab and plus 40% of the seats are supposed to be below the median now having said so how is it going to happen i mean um, until vaccines come out are airlines going to cut corners are services going to go down because the cost i think are going to go up in terms of cleaning and sanitation processes that they will follow the cost are in fact going to go up if anything uh, if not anything else so how how does that balance happen and does the load uh, eventually come on the traveler either through uh, fares but if the fares are uh, controlled by the government through cut services cut in services how is that happening you see this is exactly the point which we have mentioned before i think all of us this is this element of uncertainty this is a situation which has has never been experienced by any airline or any 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 government in in the past and in the absence of you know any clear planning any clear developments at the moment nothing is stable we can only st uh, we can only speculate it will an impact but there is in, in at least in my opinion there is no clear solution which is applicable everywhere be it in india or europe that is that is the biggest issue you see um, um we were talking about capacities um, i i i still know the figures of lufthansa because um, you know uh, that is an example which i do remember 90% of the fleet is still grounded in order to to have the fleet operating again you know if it's taking too long even the flight crews be it cabin uh, uh, cockpit crews they have to renew their, their licenses they have to they have to they have to check each and every demand situation they have to find out whether um, you know existing routes can be flown and when they could start even if an airline says we wanted to fly to india now uh, three times a day the question is are the travelers from a particular country allowed to travel from let's say uk to india is this has this travel ban be lifted and so on so this is just one uh, little example but it is a very high complexity of of uh, of issues and open uh, questions which have not been uh, clarified and i wanted to add one more point before forgetting it because it's it's uh, we have touched it but it's a sustainable uh, issue this is these are the the health care or the health protection effects um just in brief um you know we have experienced that over the years uh, security aspects has become more and more important they have extended the procedures on the ground and they have also contributed to um increasing the cost the operational cost of airlines and and airports the same effect will happen uh, with on the, on the health side don't expect this to go away of even if you are not wearing mask anymore which i wish to happen uh, you know on very short notice but uh, i i don't firmly i do firmly believe that these health checks will continue in one way to the other standardized internationally but they will have an impact on on the duration of travel the handling on the ground and for this we have to be prepared i don't know how far it goes but we should keep it in our mind you know these protectional measures which are so cumbersome at the moment they will definitely not go but they will uh, become a part of our life in the future uh, thank you very much bernard actually there's, there's quite a few uh, questions lined up so i'll try to go through them quickly the next one was uh, subash subash verma you had a question yes please uh, can thank you, you hear me yes yes can i can you hear you perfectly me? thank you yes, yes. so uh, my question is to mr vander hazen my ex uh, boss in india uh, from lufthansa <laughs> okay <laughs> uh whether which you are a specialist in india and germany especially uh, i want to ask you as, as germans as a leisure traveler a kind of a leading uh, role model for the as a leisure traveler what do you think in 6 months time maybe or maybe 9 months what is the general sentiment now of the germans will remain so whether to india or to anywhere else 
what is the uh, what's your views on this uh, as a it's great talking to you it's quite emotional thank hearing your voice again after a long time thank uh, you i'm impressing i'm impressing my personal views uh, particularly the, the travel segment to germany is is a is a high profile segment this is no yeah. not low budget travel these are you know the you have handled this business these are quite affluent people and they're not traveling because there's a travel ban. There are restrictions on travel. I personally believe the moment, you know, the, the, the Indian government permits Germans to travel again and there are no uh, in, new uh, infrastructural uh, problems or let's say problems with, uh, with uh, concerning uh, handling and so on. Uh, okay. The German, the Germany, India uh, leisure, leisure travel will pick up again because there is, I mean, uh, India has shown in the past couple of months from the tourist point of view that they were very strict. They were react, uh, responded very quickly. The press, um, you know, in Germany uh, concerned India is not negative with the exception of, you know, the poor people, uh, you know, which uh, have been affected. But uh, on tourism, I, I do expect that midterm the business will pick up. There are no reasons why it shouldn't. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you Thanks. Thank, Thank you for your question, Subhash. Um, you. Mark, Mark, I believe you had a question. I do. Thank you, Carl. Um, I'm just going to make one quick observation and then ask my question. My observation is this, that, you know, post 9-11, uh, the industry was doom and gloom and was never going to recover. The reality is, of course, that once security uh, procedures were introduced and we thought that they would be short term, but of course, they're still with us now almost 20 years ago, the industry entered an unprecedented period of growth. Uh, my expectation is that we will find some similar solutions to this and that we will quite quickly find ourselves back in a period where we become comfortable with traveling in a way that we did quite quickly after 9-11. Um, um, I, what I wanted, my question is to pick up on the point that I think it was Ketan made earlier. And my question to the panel is this. Should government be subsidizing and bailing out um, airlines or should they be subject to market forces and should we allow some of them to go to the wall? Uh, Vimal? Yeah, so first of all, let me congratulate Mark for finally using the word that we were all trying to avoid, which is unprecedented. <laughs> um, but jokes aside, um, I think it's very clear that assuming a vaccine comes out, that would, that would obviously go a long way towards resetting everything back to, you know, to, to some kind of normality as we used to know it, right? Um, more directly to your question, and actually Ketan asked exactly, in, in my opinion, I think Ketan pretty much hinted at the same question. Um, look, I think what the government has done in the short, well, hope, okay, first thing, I hope what the government has done is for the short term, right? I, I hope it's not for the long term because the government has now step in to regulate airfares, both the lower and the upper band, which is entirely the wrong thing to do as far as the free market goes, right? It's gonna spoil the market forevermore. Particularly when they try to lift it, they're gonna have a lot of unhappiness. Now, it's the wrong thing to do because it takes, it takes no cognizance of the cost of providing those operations by the airlines. It takes no cognizance of brand recognition Right? And airlines in India, as I think somebody said, said it, that you know, travel, uh, air travel in India is actually very much an aspirational uh, hope for many people. And the brands, you know, the jet airways of the world, I used to work for jet, by the way, the indigos of the world, uh, even to some extent, spice jet, and even, even Air India, right? For every, five, for every 10 people I speak to, there are at least five people who who remark wistfully about how good Air India used to be in the past, right? So the brand valuation and the brand uh, resonance is not taken into account when somebody sets lower and upper bands of fares. I believe it's only in the short term. I believe it's to protect the market. I believe it's to encourage some kind of operational relaunch by airlines by telling them that, look, we're guaranteeing some level of revenue for you in some form or the other. And I really sincerely hope that this does not continue beyond, let's say, three months or six months. Not even for that long, hopefully. Thanks, Amal. Thanks a lot. So, yeah, um, uh, sorry, time. sorry, Carl. Uh, just to add to Bimal what he has said, uh, government has specified that the capping of the fares is restricted to three months as of now. 
so let's hope that it will not continue beyond three months just to uh, make a point you know but uh, as so of now like the lockdown right the lockdown kept getting extended right <laughs> no no i know but I, I thought let me just make that point and to clarify yeah. that you know and i also wanted exactly. to make a very quick point on the question which was raised by ketan about the cost per passenger or the cost of transaction going up due to many other uh, parameters and the safety and security and the health norms which have come up you know uh, any such situation brings lot more new innovations lot more new alignments lot more new partnerships you know you would see that many things would happen internally within the airline industry which will bring down the cost per passenger or the cost per ticket over a period of time whether that would be more and more automation or digitization or the partnerships or the alignments or or some other uh, streamlining of the processes you know however we are about to see a a, a solid reengineering within the organizations to bring down the costs you know i think it is up on the cards you know and and possibly you would see that the cost per transaction cost per passenger would significantly come down within the airlines you know. maybe thank you probably thanks okay. thanks a lot um mr chavla i believe you have a question yeah thank you yes. am hello. i audible yes yes hello mr chavla how are you i am good good morning to everybody and uh i have a question for mr heeson because i know him he is our consultant i am representing a german company in india and we manufacture molds and machines our travel is for our machines what we export to our asian countries middle east south american and african country so we don't travel for our tourism or pleasure but we have to travel for our needs for installing the machines we have already developed many technology wherein we will see the machine operating and somebody will work as per instructions of our technician but still we cannot avoid we have to travel there is no other option so is government taking any concerns of people like us otherwise economy will be a big impact on us so the cost impact of our travel will definitely go to customer that also will impact our business but if government is supporting so many other areas then essential travels what is the opinion of uh, maybe indian government or german government for that um thank you mr chola there is a lot of pressure on the governments um not only from airlines but also from the consumer from the corporates on both sides uh to uh, to to facilitate or to to release restrictions if they are uh which are now very much impacted uh, because of uh, precautionary uh, you know health uh, uh, measures which cannot be uh, you know lifted immediately because of the absence we have mentioned this before of any vaccination or things like this so governments wanted to be um, a bit careful but for instance if you take the german government for instance they have just announced that by the middle of june they there is a travel ban worldwide out of germany for instance should be lifted and it has yet to be seen it's, it's due to be announced shortly and it's had yet to be seen how this will uh, affect business between india and germany and vice versa but i think the pressures are high becoming higher and and more intensive by the day also on the governments to uh, to uh, to facilitate it but the answer is not yet clear because we have to see what is happening because there are some uh, unpredictable developments also uh, which have to be taken into account but there is a tendency yes to become to come back to normal as soon as possible So I I just wanted to add to this to answer the question if I may Carl. Yeah, please please go ahead. Um, so there there's two developments that I think give hope, right? Uh and not, neither of them are happening in India at the moment, Mr. Chavla. Um the, the first one is something which you guys might have heard of. It's called travel bubbles or travel corridors. So there are a couple of countries or a few countries coming together like for example Israel, New Zealand, Australia, Austria, Greece and so on so they're banding together to say okay citizens of these countries can travel to each other's countries um and and you know you'd be fine right so you just have to do some health declarations and do some tests and whatever and you'd be fine and then of course there are countries where it's completely banned right so that's the, that's the travel bubbles and travel corridors which might help if india starts to do that i expect that to be quite tough because 
um, I just want to be discreet about this, but I expect it to be tough because I'm not sure that everybody entirely trusts um, the health declarations and so on that come out of countries like India and, and China. I mean, I, I, I'm fine with it. I'm just saying there are countries that don't trust, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing is um, uh, something which is also a development in Europe. Um, it's called immunity passports, right? And that's based on a lot of antibody testing, which has now become a lot better. Now, I'm not a virologist or a biologist, but from what I read and from what I know about the industry, there's a lot of good test kits being, being made available now, which are thoroughly tested after so many months. And they can actually genuinely tell if somebody has the antibodies. And without going into the details, what that means is that that allows travelers to be tested and certified as either COVID free for a certain number of days or having had COVID and recovered because you've got the antibodies and so on, right? So once you have those immunity passports, um, I could imagine that something like that would be easily available online, certified through laboratories, certified laboratories. And if you have that, then I think even as an Indian or a Chinese or whoever it is, you can travel, right? You'll be allowed into other countries. So I think these are the two developments that uh, we should keep an eye on, which are outside of uh, particular uh, things that are being done by the government in India. Thanks. Thanks, Anand. Thank um, I think we have time to squeeze in one more question. Um, uh, Nitin Tabib. Hi, Carl. Good afternoon. Hi, Nitin. How are you? Good, good, good. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, namaste from India. Namaste. Uh, so basically, uh, you know, a lot of, most of my question is actually covered in bits and parts where, uh, you know, Mr. Verma spoke about <clears throat> travel on uh, leisure. Mark spoke about bouncing back, uh, you know, organizations need to bounce, bounce back. Uh, Mr. Gandhi just now spoke about business process re-engineering, digitization, things like that. So where I'm coming from is essentially uh, way back in the early 2000s, I used to be selling online collaboration tools, okay, virtual classrooms, symposium, webinars, so on and so forth. Uh, but it wasn't very successful because the fact is that while technology was in place, obviously bandwidth was an issue, but also it was more of the mindset of people where they believe that business can only happen when you meet people in fresh and blood. Now, going forward, you know, because of this COVID thing, uh, you know, people are forced to adopt technology which they which was available more than a decade ago. So it's going to be more of a mindset change. Uh, my first part of the question to all you know people from the airline industry is that you know uh, travel happens because of business, and as Mr. Chavla confirmed, that business is inevitable for him. You know, if he does not his people do not travel, you know, his business is going to suffer. So there is a business travel which is mandating and there is a leisure travel. So from a, uh, from a, a ratio perspective, where do you think, uh, you know, airlines going, are going to take most of the hit? Is it going to be for business because of mandates from the corporate or is it going to be because of, uh, you know, people don't want to travel because of the leisure? That's my first part. And a follow-up question to that is when we are talking about business process re-engineering or you know, digitization or, you know, whatever other innovations that organizations need to do. Uh, you know, this, this question is more, uh, you know, from uh, Mr. Gandhi, if he could address, what does he feel in his opinion that this innovation has to come from the airlines part or is it going to be more from, uh, you know, the corporates that they, uh, you know, give business to the airlines? Thank you. So, uh, Nathan, let me let me start uh, by addressing some of the points that you have raised. Yes, when I was referring to, I was referring to bringing down the cost of transaction or the cost per passenger from the aviation industry. You know, because we were at that stage of time, uh, we were discussing about the cost of the airlines going up and vis-a-vis -vis the fares that they are going to be charging. You know. uh, but that said, there would be further innovations, there would be further digitization, even in the travel service providers like the travel agencies, you know. And possibly there would be some linked uh, changes or the digitization even in the corporates, you know, as to how they really give their bookings, you know. I mean, presently, if you really look at it, only very, very large companies uh, or, or, the, or the organizations are using the self-booking tools. Uh, medium class companies are not, mid-level, mid-volume companies are not. So possibly you would see more and more companies would embracing the self-booking tools and that would be linked to the uh, uh, service providers, that would be linked to the payment processes so that it becomes a touchless 
and a, and a absolutely a automated process you know uh, yes the beginning of that would start and it will take its own time to really reach up to the level that we are talking about innovations are not going to be overnight but i think the process is going to begin you know uh, that that is my my firm opinion on that you know. uh, that is on the, on the cost of transaction and the this thing secondly coming on to the business travel and coming on to the layer travel you know. mm -hmm. as of now it is being seen that the 50% of the business comes from the business travel and the balance 50% comes from the layer or outbound travel that could be because of holidays or that could be mice now the yields of both the businesses differ very very significantly the yield from the business travel which possibly werner would confirm in, in, in maybe after my point he can come on and verify that the yields on the airlines from the business travel is comparatively significantly very high in comparison to the layer travel uh, so both the parts of the businesses are very very important from the aviation perspective business travel as i said in the short term will remain muted but once the vaccine really comes out once the comfort level is high definitely it will really pick up again you know there is nothing like sitting across the table and then negotiating a business and concluding a business then doing it on the e meetings you know however it might come as a as a as a news to uh, some of us that tcs has done a very significant progress in terms of uh, working from home now immediately after the lockdown i mean the, the two months were over and they really announced that 45% of their employ employees will continue to work from home for the next two years and i did a rough calculation that the 45000 employees of tcs are working from their home and assuming that they occupy 50 square feet per person and they are paying rupees 50 as a rental for per person you know or per, per square feet they are able to save about 20 to 25 euros per annum you know now this is the direct saving of the real estate there would be related savings in terms of uh, commuting communication and other 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 pieces of the business you know and tcs has also announced that by 2023 they would like 75% of their employees to really start working from the home you know imagine how it is going to change the equation in terms of travel local travel international travel domestic travel uh, that, that that that's the point i i, I really wanted to make you know now coming on to the holiday travel or the layer travel or the mice travel i think lot depends on as to how and when the vaccine is going to be available you know uh, as of now people would be little apprehensive of traveling on the holidays going to any place particularly in the groups group business or the mice business which which is as we call it incentive travel possibly would be the slow to pick up unless or until the vaccine comes in place and unless or until the quarantine policies of the various countries is is clear you know as of now vimal has already touched upon the fact that different com com countries are coming out with the different policies on quarantine unless that gets clarified i think the incentive movements possibly it would be difficult to predict where will the business go how much business will really pick up how soon or how delayed it would pick up i think lot depends on the availability of the vaccine okay thank you very much uh praveen i i think unfortunately we've run out of time right and um apologies if we started a little bit late a couple of minutes late and uh if anybody didn't get a chance to ask their question that feel free to send it in by email and we'll pass it on to the panelists and we'll get back to you that's probably the best way to do that so um a huge thank you from me um, to all of our panelists to to Vimal Praveen and Verna and also a huge thank you to all of you participants for taking part and making this very interactive so i enjoyed it very much so um thank you thank you very much thank you thank you thanks for done god for putting this thanks right right Thank you. Bye-bye.